Good evening and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know. You can find us online at commonwealthclub.org, on Facebook and Twitter, and on our YouTube channel. My name is Nikki Silvestri, and I'm the co-founder of Silvestri Strategies, also the former executive director of People's Grocery, and I'm your moderator for today's program. We want to thank the California Wellness Foundation for sponsoring this discussion regarding food, health, and vulnerable Americans. According to the United States Department of Agriculture, more than 48 million people in America are food insecure. That means they don't have access to fresh, affordable, healthy food. This is the result of many interconnected factors. In rural areas, there may be a lack of access to grocery stores. In inner city communities, there may be an abundance of fast food chains and convenience stores. And a national culture that subsidizes high calorie, low nutrient leisure foods instead of produce doesn't help much either. As our national health suffers, obesity, heart disease, and diabetes have become the public health epidemic of this generation. And I have a personal connection to this because many members of my family deal with diet-related disease. It's how I got into this work in the first place, because I didn't know if it was normal to have all of your great aunts and uncles be amputees from diabetes. So this topic is very dear to me. How can we create communities where healthy food is accessible, appealing, and affordable? Here to discuss the current state of the American food system and its impact on the health of all Americans, especially the most vulnerable, is Dr. Hilary Seligman, who wears many hats at the University of California, San Francisco, where she works in the departments of epidemiology and biostatistics. She is core faculty for San Francisco General Hospital Center for Vulnerable Populations and the Center for Disease Control's Nutrition and Obesity Policy Research and Evaluation Network. Did you get all that? <laughs> Basically, she's the bomb. Yeah. <laughs> she is also so senior true. medical advisor and lead scientist of Feeding America, if that wasn't enough. Doria Robertson is the executive director of Urban Tilth, a community-based group that cultivates agriculture in Contra Costa County here in Northern California. They aim to build a more sustainable, healthy, and just food system. Urban Tilth hires and trains residents to work with schools, community-based organizations, government agencies, businesses, and individuals to develop the capacity to produce 5% of our own food supply. And I can speak from personal experience that Doria was one of the people I looked up to when I first started getting into food systems work. And she is tireless and incredibly dedicated to the work. Eli Zegas is the Food and Agriculture Policy Director at SPUR, a Bay Area nonprofit focused on good planning and good government. Their goal is to bring people together from across the political spectrum to develop solutions to the big problems our cities face. Eli has been the lead author of many SPUR reports, including one about how San Francisco Bay Area residents can have greater access to healthy food. Originally from DC, he came to California by way of Iowa. And although I haven't had any experience with Eli personally, I can say that anyone who is that devoted to policy and data and research and numbers, considering how much we need it, is a king in my book. <laughs> We're going to start with Dr. Seligman, who's going to share a little bit with us about her work, which is really involved with what are the health implications of how people interact with the kinds of foods that they have access to? What are the implications for our bodies? What are the implications for our communities? Thank you. Well, really, the, the place to start is understanding that there is no question that food insecurity is bad for your health. And it's bad for your health at every stage of the life course. There is now decades of research among children that show children who are food insecure or live in households where there is not adequate access to nutritious food have decreased intellectual development, poor emotional development, and uh, decreased cognitive development in addition to a number of health problems like asthma and iron deficiency anemia and symptoms of anxiety and depression. We know that these children are also at higher need of being hospitalized and going to the emergency room. 
Pregnant women who are food insecure have smaller, sicker babies. They're more likely to be food insecure. And adult, I mean, they're more likely to um, have iron deficiency anemia. And adults who are food insecure also tends to be more ill. They have more diet sensitive chronic disease like obesity and diabetes, more mental health problems, and poor general health status, which is important because your general health status or how you respond to the question, how in general would you rate your health, is very tightly correlated with your risk of death. So we know that food insecurity and health are intertwined in really important ways. And there are two ways um, that I think we should concentrate on. The, the first is that being sick in the US costs a lot of money. And we know that out-of-pocket health care expenditures uh, are often very high in food insecure households. And illness and disability makes it more challenging for people to earn a stable income. And these drain the, food, the household budget and make people more likely to be food insecure. So your income is low, you're more likely to be food insecure. We know, for example, from our Hunger in America studies of food pantry users that 66% of people coming to the food pantry report that they had to make a choice between buying food and buying medicine or medical care. So that's the first reason, is it costs a lot of money to be sick in the US. But the second important reason is that if you live in a food insecure household, you engage a number of coping strategies in order to avoid the physical sensation of hunger. Nobody wants to be hungry. We're hardwired to avoid that. And those coping strategies are really adaptive in the short term. They keep you from going hungry, but they aren't adaptive in the long term. So for example, if you shift the foods you eat to cheaper foods that tend to be highly processed, very energy dense, nutrient poor foods, and away from relatively expensive foods like fruits and vegetables, that may be good in the short term, but it's not good for you in the long term. Similarly, if you anticipate that you're not going to have enough food at the end of the month, and so you eat a lot of food today, tomorrow, and the next day in order to buffer yourself against that time period when food runs out, we know that is bad for your health in the long term and predisposes people to obesity and diabetes. So food insecurity uh, is um, likely to make you ill, and once you get ill, you're more likely to be food insecure. So very complex relationships. Terribly unfortunate. Thank you for painting that picture. Now, Eli, mm -hmm. having heard that, I'm wondering if you can give us a little bit of the broad brushstrokes of the sure. Bay Area and tell us a bit about the policy work that you do. Yeah. Um, and it's funny you introduced me as liking numbers because I, I do like numbers. And so what I thought I'd start with is painting that picture, just like you said, to give uh, the audience a sense of where we're at today. And, and I'd say it, it doesn't look very good um, nationally or here in the Bay Area when it comes to hunger and diet-related disease. So UCLA does a survey pretty much constantly um, uh, asking people health questions. And one of the questions they ask is, did you have difficulty affording food? Uh, did you reduce the amount of food you ate this week or the number of meals you had? And what they found is here in the Bay Area, about 11% of adults report being food insecure. Or put another way, that's one in every eight people here in the Bay Area, adults saying they're skipping meals or they find themselves hungry at some point. That's better than the state of California as a whole, where it's closer to one in every six people, uh, which is about what it is nationally. So if you looked around and you picked six people and you chose one of them, that's the number of people in California nationally who are saying, I'm having trouble affording enough food. Like Hillary was saying, that has huge impacts on health, specifically through diet-related disease. And over time, uh, we're not doing so great on that either. Today in the Bay Area, uh, one in five adults are obese, um, and that's up significantly in the past 15 years. And in California, it's a quarter, one in every four adults. Um, rates of diabetes have gone up significantly also in the past few decades. And I'll say on the food insecurity, those numbers have also gone up significantly, and there was a huge jump right at the recession. The, the third way you can paint the picture or, or think about why would we care about these issues is not only is access to healthy food have impacts on hunger and health, uh, but is also a question of quality of life. Um, and I, the way we think about that is that there are people in some neighborhoods in San Francisco or pick any city 
where it's just a walk down the street to find food that we would consider healthy, wholesome. Uh, and there are people across town in neighborhoods where they have to travel a far distance. They have to get in a car, they have to get in a bus, they have to walk a really far way, um, and it's much less convenient for them, just at a basic level. Um, it, it's an issue of quality of life, convenience, and also one of, one of equity. So for us, when we think about why should policymakers care and why I hope you all care, it's for those three reasons. And then the, the thing I wanted to end with in, in terms of framing this is that when we think about, well, what is it? What is it that's stopping people from accessing healthy food? Why aren't more people eating healthy? Uh, it really comes down to four barriers. One is physical. Can you find healthy food? So that's what grocery options are there in your neighborhood? What does the corner store offer? Do you have a farmer's market? It's physically, what can you find? Then the next barrier is an economic barrier. So you can find the food, but can you afford it? And I think we'll be talking a lot about that tonight, so I won't dwell on that too much. The next is, even if you can find and afford the food, do you know what to do with it? So that's an educational barrier. Do you know how to make healthy choices? Do you understand nutrition? Do you know how to cook? Uh, that can often be a barrier to eating healthily. And then lastly, it's not the best term, but cultural barrier. And that's really, do you want it? So you can find the food, you can afford the food, you know what a healthy choice is and how to cook it, but do you want it? And I think one of the best examples of that is when you look in the school meals context, kids love pizza. And, and they also love Red Hot Cheetos. And, and getting kids to want something else is a, is a cultural shift, a, a change in demand. And so strategies to try and address that really get at making it easier for, for people to find, afford, and choose healthy food. And I think that's where the policy interventions we're talking about fall into one of those kinds of categories. Thank you, Eli, for that summary. Now, Doria. In terms of taking it home and grounding this in a community for us, can you tell us a little bit about your work at Urban Tilth? Right. So um, it's always interesting to hear the numbers when you're living the experience, the reality. Um, Urban Tilth is a 10-year-old organization running in Richmond, California, which is in West Contra Costa County across the Bay. Um, it's kind of in the shadow of Chevron, the Chevron refinery. Um, most of our work happens in the flatlands where people are primarily low-income people of color, very low-income, no-income people of color, immigrants. Um, we have one grocery store for 130,000 people. It's um, a Foods Co., so it's not a high-end grocery store. It's kind of a low-cost, you know, kind of everything in boxes on shelves type of, of thing. Um, if you do not have a car, you are most likely getting your food from the corner store mostly. And then when you have an access, when you have time, when you have a car, when you have somebody to give you a ride, um, you'll go to the grocery store. Uh, there are a lot of people in our community who have trouble getting enough food, affording enough food to eat. There are a lot of crisis food programs, soup kitchens, um, the, the food pantries, the, um, all these different things. Um, there are a lot of people who are sick, who are obese, who are struggling with heart disease, there are a lot of children who are obese. West Contra Costa County has one of the highest rates of childhood obesity in this area of California. Um, over the last 10 years, Urban Tilth has really been working on those last two elements of what Eli talked about, like really working on um, changing the culture of food uh, so that people have a desire to even want to eat healthy food, because I think that the condition of being poor, when you are constantly stressed to work, 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 multiple jobs, you're, you know, you're tired when you get home, you, you need an easy solution, and unfortunately in our community, the easy solution is something that's high in fat, high in sugar, low in cost. Um, it, it, in order to change that culture, it's, it's a, a matter of changing your taste, yes, like wanting to come back to actually liking the taste of fruits and vegetables because um, what we get at Foods Co. is not the highest end fruits and vegetables out there. They don't always taste 
the way that people remember them if they had grandmothers and grandfathers who grew things at home. Um, so oftentimes kids will say, well, fruits and vegetables are nasty, right? Um, so Urban Health has been working there. We've started 13 different school and community gardens across Richmond. Um, we have a garden, a uh, series of gardens along uh, public parks where you can actually just go out, they're grazing gardens, and anyone at any time can harvest food and take it back home to amend their, their week's supply. And people will do that. I actually just did that on Saturday. I walked my dogs and I picked some greens and some mint for home, <laughs> for breakfast. Um, we also teach about um, how to cook, right? because most of the, the kids these days are growing up, spending a lot of time by themselves because their parents are out working or their parents are struggling with other issues of addiction or other things, and they don't know how to cook. They know how to open a package and put it in a microwave or put it in boiling water, and, and, and that's cooking, right? So we always have an element of cooking to all of our programs, um, and with that, we make it a social experience because so much of um, the work that's been done around food is kind of you know kind of tabled with in nutrition and you know shoulds and shouldn'ts and I think that people kind of know the shoulds and shouldn'ts in general but they don't get that feeling of of warmth and fun and kind of hanging out with your friends and we're gonna make some food together often in the context that we normally deal with changing people's food habits. And so, for instance, at Richmond High School, we run an urban agriculture and American food systems class. It's an elective that kids take for a year. And every Friday, they cook together <laughs> as a group. Um, they cook their, their lunch from the garden, from the things that they've been growing. Um, and it's, it's a serious social time where they hang out and they talk about it and they try to make things, the, the teacher of the class actually talks about how he tries to make things where folks in the class would wanna cook it for their boyfriend or girlfriend. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something kinda cool, something interesting. And that, that's exactly what happens. They'll go home and they'll make these meals for their parents. Um, a cultural shift, right? I think that it's so hard to get at all of the different factors that are driving um, the state of health in underserved communities. Um, to really put your, your thumb on uh, the pressure that we have, not just from access, but from you know, poverty um, and from stress and from even having the way with all to make the space to cook or having the equipment to cook. So Urban Health has been working in that space of kind to trying to cre make, create a cultural space where things can slow down, where we can grow together and it's okay to spend that time, where we can cook together and it's okay to spend that time, where we can reclaim public space and create new access points for healthy food, and it's okay. We have that space, we have that time. That's where we've been working, and for the next 10 years, we're looking to work somewhere else, and we'll talk about that later. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Doria. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about the current circumstances. What does food insecurity look like, painting the picture for people? I'm curious about restating or emphasizing quickly, just so we're all on the same page, the main barriers, the main obstacles to getting to fresh and healthy food. And along with that, if you had to get to the root of the problem, what would that be from your different perspectives? From my perspective, the problem starts <coughs> with financial accessibility of food. And the reason I say this is because if you live in a community like Doria perfectly describes, where there isn't adequate money in the neighborhood or in the community to support the purchase of fruits and vegetables from the stores, 
then there is no incentive for the markets to carry those fruits and vegetables. And, and furthermore, why would you stock fruits and vegetables if there isn't adequate money in the, in the community to purchase them? Because those fruits and vegetables will rot on your shelves uh, and that will be lost profit for you. So I firmly believe, and many, many studies show this, that there is a demand for healthy foods in all of our neighborhoods in the US. But unless we can support people in being able to actually go out and purchase them, we get into a problem where the neighborhoods become devoid of those fruits and vegetables, and then we call them uh, food deserts. And it's a very challenging chicken and an egg problem. From my perspective, the fundamental problem is the lack of finances. Thank you. So I could very much agree and would just phrase it another way. Um, the un one of the biggest underlying issues we have is poverty and income inequality. So sort of structurally, uh, the way that wealth is distributed in the country leads to many people not having enough money to make ends meet. Um, and that you could tackle that in a number of different ways. I think long term, uh, we're talking about raising people's incomes. And, and that can be through education and job training. Those are sort of long term sustainable ways, you hope. Um, when that doesn't work, or if that's not enough, you have medium term strategies, which are things like a minimum wage in California, thankfully just raised its and New York did as well. Uh, but across the country is hasn't been adjusted in oh, over 15 years. Um, you're talking about income transfers like the earned income tax credit, which helps some people uh, get more money at the end of the year or at the end of the tax year. And then you have safety net programs, which provide people either through school meals or through SNAP, formerly known as food stamps, money to afford food and other strategies like that. Um, we need to address all the barriers you know, if you have demand but there's no supply, it's, it's going to be hard. Um, if you have supply and you have a store and no one's got the money or the interest in buying it, it's not going to work. So you need all of, you need to address all the barriers. Um, mm -hmm. But I think I agree with Hillary that uh, addressing poverty is really one of the, the root causes and root issues we have to deal with if we want to address healthy food access. Mm -hmm. Doya, anything to add there? Um, one point on that, and yes, poverty is the source of food insecurity, <laughs> period, end of question. It's, it's poverty, um, as well as kind of how we deal with food in this country in terms of the, the farm bill and who gets subsidies and who doesn't, you know, driving the price of food. Um, I think I also want to say that if we're really interested in changing the situation on the ground in underserved communities, we have to think about how do we get the people from underserved communities, the people who are poor, in positions where they can lead in these solutions um, and not just be recipients of the solution because that actually keeps them dependent. And I think that that's the one thing that I am, I, I adore safety nets, no one should go hungry, food is right. But it shouldn't be a safety net that is always used always needed in order to make ends meet month after month, year after year, that's when it's a problem. And that's when we really need to think about how do we empower people to start the stores that we need to see, to maintain the stores that are there and improve them if they're already you know, beautiful immigrant markets that are, are there. How do we empower them to improve those markets to further serve our communities? How do we improve people's access to entrepreneurial you know, opportunities. So they are a part of the solution because then they will be on the edge of cultural change because it actually has an impl implication for their success, for their business success. They'll be making sure that those, that, that, that cultural change that we need is happening because it just helps their businesses, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, that's just so important. If we really want to see this change happen in underserved communities, the uh, people <coughs> themselves need to be in leadership roles and directly benefiting. Um. So I'm hearing poverty clearly across the board with an added take of we're not just getting people out of poverty by doing this. We are ensuring that everyone who, that everyone is a leader, a builder, a creator. 
at the end of the day. We had a couple of very interesting questions. Feel free not to answer this if you don't want to. Um, but I'm, I'm deeply curious <laughs> about marketing. You all mentioned culture. And Eli, I think you were the one who talked about whether people want the food. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple questions in here about advertising mm -hmm. and media mm -hmm. and the way that it really emphasizes the types of foods that are not particularly healthy. And zucchini doesn't have its own channel or commercial. Mm -hmm. So what would you all say about that when it comes to the influence of media? There's no question that this is an enormous problem. There is no question that unhealthy foods are marketed much more often than healthy foods to children. And there is no question, the data is very clear, that most of those advertisements are focused on reaching low-income and vulnerable children who are also at the greatest risk of obesity and diabetes. There are two ways to address this from a policy perspective. One is to support fruit and vegetable vendors in creating their own marketing strategies. And for a host of reasons, um, that is very challenging. Uh, in particular because there is not just one farmer, thank goodness, of apples and broccoli. There are hundreds and, or thousands of farmers of apples and broccoli. And the other way to do this is to make policy decisions that restrict the ability of the unhealthy food marketers uh, to reach particularly low-income and vulnerable children. I will say that not only do we know that, the, um, that these advertisements exist, but we know that they are extraordinarily powerful. And I think the question just helps us to understand the complexity of the food system, and that even though we would like to boil this down to one issue, like poverty or finances, really, in order to be successful in addressing food insecurity as a nation, we're going to have to chip away at a lot of different problems in our food system. Yep, like taste the <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, one way to illustrate this is when you go through the supermarket, look at where Tony the Tiger is. And is Tony the Tiger at your eye level or at your child's eye level? Um, and chances are it's, it's a little below your eye level. Um, we looked at this in terms of policy-wise, how effective are government marketing campaigns? So five a day um, or eat, eat, taste the rainbow. And the trick, it, that's sort of a fight fire with fire approach. You know, if there's lots of marketing from the junk food industry, uh, let's just saturate the airwaves with marketing on fruits and vegetables. And whatever the reason, whether it's because we're not willing to put money from the federal government or the producers themselves can't band together and do it, um, the, the fire that the, the food industry has is so much larger, so much more pervasive, um, that it's an incredibly uphill battle uh, and unlikely to succeed at the budget levels that we put towards it. That can be a little different when it comes to targeted things like kick the can or soda free summer, um, things that are targeted to this is maybe bad for you, don't drink it. Um, there's some evidence that that can have a lasting impact, but it's really difficult to fight fire with fire when it comes to marketing budgets if you're talking about a government versus the food industry. And so then I think the question does become there's more of a policy case to be made that marketing to children um, is something that could be regulated as opposed to general marketing, which gets into free speech issues. And that marketing to children, um, should you be able to advertise sugary cereals during cartoons? You know, should we, uh, on, for a city level, should at the zoo and, and museums that especially target children, sh should cities have the power to say, if you're on public property, you can't have any junk food here because we know it's really reaching children. You know, there, there are things at the federal level and at the local level that are policy that could be regulation, but um, marketing's tough because the industry makes a lot of money, which gets back to what's subsidized and what's not and what has a large profit margin and what doesn't. Truly, my childhood would have been entirely different without Kant Chocula <laughs> and the Kix Rabbit. And I mean, these are, I mean, Kid Vid from Burger King, like these were people to me growing up, you know? And you laugh, and I think we laugh, but there's a real implication to the emotional connection I had as a child to sugary and fast food. Yeah. 
because of the, the advertisements. I mean, I do think that advertisements are, you know, there's no, there's no doubt that advertisements are very powerful, but, you know, in our community, the phenomena is Takis, right? Like, mm -hmm. all the kids eat Takis, this weird kind of, you know, um, chip thing. There aren't any advertisements for Takis on TV, mm -hmm. but every single kid in our neighborhood eats them like they're going out of style in, you know, big boxes, and if you don't, you know, mm -hmm. um, I think that yes, there's work to be done in terms of policy with advertisements and, and possibly you know, creating this kind of you know, broccoli you know, industry sponsored advertisements, but culture, there's something to be said about culture change and about the influence of other people on people to make changes. One of the kids in our, um, we have a summer apprentice program that we run and one of the kids in the summer apprentice program, she said, you know, we, are, we have this annual camping trip we do every year and we do this big talk out at the fire. And she was like, you know, I think things would really change if it was like a norm, if you couldn't really get a date if you were known to have like bad eating habits, you know? Like, oh, he eats at Mc McDonald's. Like, oh, he doesn't really take care of himself, you know? <laughs> like, uh, I kind of want somebody who like takes care of themselves and like, you know, makes different choices and, you know, <laughs> and she was serious, you know? She was like, if that was what was up and everyone had to keep up with the Joneses on how they took care of themselves and what choices they made, um, then things would, would change. And I, I say that to be kind of funny, but I think she did have a point. Like there needs to be the culture makers, you know, picking up on the memes that we want our kids to really get involved in and have that be the, the social pressures that are going on. It has to be matched, of course, with access because if you know, there's that pressure there but nowhere to get the healthy alternative, then it's not gonna work. You know, the default solution still has to be a healthy solution in order for any marketing or any other cultural change to work. So mm -hmm. like um, uh, Hillary was saying, there is, it's gonna be a multi, multiple approach but I, I wouldn't underscore the power of person-to-person -person cultural change. Absolutely. Right. As, as, as much as Count Chocula <laughs> and the, those Keebler elves were a big part of my life, we ate very healthy as kids because my mama did not play. <laughs> and my family knew the importance of healthy food, especially as those who were getting older in our family were dealing with diet-related disease. Mm -hmm. So culture was paramount. I think, even with the advertisements. I think this is really important in the conversation about food insecurity because these foods that our children are exposed to when they're young uh, become their comfort foods forever. Uh, and one of the things that we really worry about in food insecure households is that if you're food insecure as a child, the eating behaviors that you develop persist even into adulthood. Uh, in many cases. And so when you don't have access to healthy foods as a child, you don't have the opportunity to develop that really important culture that Doria talks about in many cases. The other thing is if you become a food insecure adult, then you have developed, uh, you're living in a very stressful household because not having access to food is one of the most stressful things you can put a household under. And the foods that then are your comfort foods, the foods that you ate as a child, are the Keebler fudge stripes and the Count Chocula. And this creates this vicious cycle where we are perpetuating the bad coping strategies that we develop as food insecure children as adults, and then we pass those eating behaviors down to our children again. And this is one way in which we keep passing on the legacy of food insecurity from generation to generation. So this is an enormous problem that lasts and lasts and lasts. So speaking of something that lasts and lasts and lasts, in order for healthy food to be prevalent in every home, the way that we want it to be. We should all be on the same page about what healthy food is. I got a question from the audience about frozen versus fresh and just getting into the weeds a little bit about what actually counts as healthy food. My perspective on that from a, from a physician side is frozen food is good. Frozen food is, um, is 
in general, frozen at the time of peak ripeness, vitamins and nutrients are in there, um, and if that is what you have access to, then that is what you should be eating. Um, because the alternative in many households is no fruits and vegetables, and we know that that has health consequences. Anything else about just what is healthy food in general to make sure that we're all on the same page? Well, we shouldn't forget from the medical perspective that a healthy diet isn't all only about fruits and vegetables. You also should have access to whole grains and lean proteins. And the, the um, rule of thumb for eating, as well as everything else, is everything in moderation. You're not going to be healthy if you only eat fruits and vegetables. You're also certainly not going to be healthy if you only eat potato chips. So we have to have balance uh, in the foods that we eat, and we have to make, make sure that people have access to all those different important elements of a healthy plate. And there have been conversations about, should we as a culture come up with standards for individual items. It's like a green light, yellow light, red light that would be on a label to say this is healthful or not. And part of the hesitancy and difficulty of doing that is that mm -hmm. your health as it's related to food is often really your diet as a whole, not each individual item. And right. this tension between what we all know is, you know, if you have a soda every now and then, it's probably going to be fine. If you have a soda every morning and every evening, it's probably not. And so um, how, how do we come up with a way to send those signals on individual items as opposed to teaching a healthy lifestyle and a, a culture of healthy eating. Indeed, because if you take away my pizza, my bi-monthly <laughs> pizza, there will be problems. <laughs> problems. So I have a question from the audience about the Affordable Care Act and whether that has had any impact at all on food insecurity. The official answer to that is we don't know because it hasn't been around long enough for us to study it. I will tell you though that lack of health insurance is a primary driver of food insecurity. So the expectation is that expansion of health insurance will ultimately help protect families. Uh, that data is still being collected though. There are many other ways in which the Affordable Care Act, though, has endeavored to address the food insecurity problem. And one of these ways is by making population health or the health of the entire community uh, and prevention of disease a primary pillar on which the Affordable Care Act rests and by giving nonprofit hospital systems incentives for investing money in their communities for prevention. That is a whole long discussion, um, but we um, certainly know that that is um, one of the goals of implementation of the ACA. Got it. Thank you. And then, Doria, we had a couple of questions about gardens, community gardens. So one question was about the edible schoolyard concept and having that be implemented far and wide everywhere. And then another question was about um, who built the gardens in Richmond right. that you work on. Right. And can you, talk, can you talk to us just a bit about how community gardens are situated in this right. bigger conversation. Right. So um, I'm one of those fans that think that every school should have a garden. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, it's uh, kids eat what they grow, period. No matter what it is, you know, they'll eat purple tree collards raw if they grew it, you know? <laughs> it's it's, it's a, a relationship to food that you can't get in a grocery store. You just can't. You know, if you've nurtured and grown something and you're kind of like its parent, um, you have a totally different relationship to it than if it came in a plastic container or off of a shelf. Um, I think that kids understand it, the complexity of their own bodies <laughs> and the environment that we need in order to raise food if they're involved in the process of growing food. I think it's essential to education. It should be in every classroom. And I love the Inevitable Schoolyard and all the different models that are out there. Um, our gardens were built by youth and volunteers from the community. That's how Urban Tilth kind of does things. We uh, hire and train youth from our community and other people from our community to actually build and maintain and run the gardens and the garden programs that we offer um, because people need jobs. You know, 
Like there's nothing better for someone to actually earn a living and then be able to make a choice with the money that they earn to buy what it is that they would like to buy to nurture their lives. That is empowering. <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is what we hope to do with you know, kind of our work is to make sure we're offering those opportunities to the people who you know, our, our uh, gardens are trying to serve and have them be the people who are running the gardens. Um, and just in terms of uh, community gardens and their role in this whole conversation, I think, you know, community gardens are not like a grocery store, you know, in, the, in that they're not there to try to feed thousands and thousands of people. That's not their function. They'll never do that. Community gardens are there for people to gather around and reclaim connection to each other and to food. And to begin to remember and understand all the work that all of our farmers and all of our farm workers do to make food available on the plate. Um, they get people out of their houses in tough communities, creating safe zones, you know, so people aren't bunkered down, only having the influence of screens to, you know, to basically influence how they live, you know. It gives them somewhere to go, a destination. Um, it also is a really easy way for someone to see their impact on the world. If you are living in a situation where nothing seems to be in, under your control, you know, you can't seem to pay your bills, you can't seem to feed your kids, you can't seem to feed yourself, you know, your parents are stressed, everything is really stressful, uh, if you can go somewhere and help build something and transform a vacant lot into a place that feeds you and feeds the people you love, that is extremely empowering. And a lot of other things will happen in the context of gathering together to actually build and create and maintain that space. People will talk to each other, people will come up with other ideas, um, people will get introduced to new concepts, people will cross paths with people that they normally would never ever talk to. African-American neighbors living next to neighbors who are from El Salvador will tell each other their life stories, which never happens on its own. So there's a lot of other healing that needs to create, take place, like what we were talking about earlier is, you know, poverty, the things that are driving people to get into a situ to, to be in the situation where their bodies are ill is, is, is yes, a function of access, but there's also all of these other drivers and stresses and, um, and, and things. And if you only comforting activity you have is to eat po cocoa puffs, you know, or grab something to put in your mouth to make you feel better, then it, it's difficult. But if you have, you know, like, I feel like crap, I'm going to go out and there's a garden day today. I'm going to go and, and be with other people. It's an alternative. It's something else to do, something else to soothe. There's somebody in the audience tonight, Jan Schilling, who runs this amazing program in Richmond called Way of Life. Another uh, uh, you know, opportunity where people come together and they exercise. And that's another place where it creates an opportunity for people to gather and then interact and, and think about their bodies and food and their, and their, and their um, social structures in a different way. And I think that that's really the real role of, of community gardens is that gathering point. You know, it's like our, our old town centers are broken in a lot of underserved, low-income communities. We don't have functioning downtowns where people have places where they can gather. Um, and community gardens play that role in our communities and other like nonprofit based or other kind of community based organizations or gathering spots. Um, mm -hmm. And just to kind of close, the last thing that it could do, and I think that this is where we really want it to go, um, is to bring up this idea of reconnecting with our regional farmers, right? Because we're not going to grow the thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds of food we need to in the little limited spaces we have in cities. But we can create these hubs of activity where people are getting excited about food and they have a relationship for food. And then we can connect with a regional farmer, somebody who is relatively close to us, and then bring in those thousands and thousands of food into that context. And then we can really create change in terms of access, especially if we've actually created an economic model that functions and works and sustains people. 
Um, so I mm. feel like there's a, a, a powerful future for community gardens if we're thinking regionally. And um, we've started something beautiful over the last you know, 20, 30 years in creating these hubs. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. That, what she said. This is the Commonwealth Club of California program, and we are talking about food, health, and vulnerable Americans with Dr. Hilary Seligman, right? Professor at the University of California, San Francisco Medical School. Doria, Roberts, Doria Robinson, Executive Director of Urban Tilt, based in Richmond, California. Eli Zegas, Food and Agriculture Policy Director at SPUR, the San Francisco Bay Area Planning and Urban Research Association. I am Nikki Silvestri, your moderator. You can hear Commonwealth Club programs on the radio, catch up with us on Facebook and Twitter, and see program videos on our YouTube channel. So we've been talking a lot about the issues. Let's shift a bit now into the solutions. What have each of you seen that you think is something that we should do more of? Or what, what, is, what are rays of hope for you when it comes to solving this problem at large? <laughs> I, I'm, I think we need to, again, if you're interested in actually solving the problem and not just, you know, putting more creative band-aids on the problem um, and easing suffering while people continue to suffer, um, I, we need to build economies that work within, within underserved communities. Um, those economies have to include the people from those communities. We have to move away from the service model where we're gonna come in and serve people who are underserved because they remain underserved even if they're served. <laughs> you know, they remain dependent upon your service and that is, is, is not solving the problem. So we need to create, we need to help uh, spur these healthy food economies within our, 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 our cities and our inner cities and in other places um, that work. And each place is really gonna be different. I mean, there's a, a really wonderful restaurant project that started in North Richmond, California. Um, from a woman who actually has been gardening for the last 40 years. And she started um, a restaurant that, that has you know, actual hours where there was no restaurant before. And so people come and they pay for healthy food, which pe their people are actually doing. <laughs> and she makes meals for seniors in the senior center and delivers meals as a part of kind of a, of, a food access um, health uh, safety net program. I think we need to be innovating um, in this way. There's another program, I think it's um, in Alameda, where they're taking food waste and creating um, a restaurant type of, of thing with that. You know, all the food that kind of rots on the shelves and nobody wants to buy it because it looks ugly is being kind of moved into um, this economic model, this model of actually creating a product um, for people than creating jobs and, and everything. So. My mind is really in, in that world of, of where the solutions lie, is, is becoming more creative and creating the things that people would like to see and helping people create the things they would like to see in their community themselves. Using the things that were formerly waste or formerly for, you know, underused or forgotten. I will add to that, that the there are many policies that we have put in place at the local, regional, state, and federal level that make this problem more challenging. And when we have, for example, lack of affordable housing, high income taxes on the poor, these things directly influence food insecurity rates. And these are the things that we can only change with our vote. And so if I, if I had to tell you to do one thing, it would be to vote for policies and candidates that make sense to support low-income communities. Um, 
that's the first thing. The second thing is um, there are situations in many low-income households where you have to rely on emergency food because you have no other alternatives. And if you are in a position to support your local food bank, you should, because that is where people go in the worst case scenario. Uh, and that is a very important source of support uh, for many people in the Bay Area. Um, and the third thing is to be an advocate in your community for systems that make sense for low-income populations and for food systems that make sense, not just for today, but that enable people to participate in a healthy, economically viable food system for many years to come. It is challenging, um, but I think we all have a responsibility to work in that direction. I agree with everything Doria and Hillary said, I think what Doria is laying out is that long-term solution, is that we're not talking about addressing the symptoms with food assistance, whether it be a subsidy or a food bank, we're talking about people earning enough to afford what they need for a healthy life. Uh, I wanna talk to you afterwards about how that translates in a policy context and what that looks like. Um, and I think what Hillary said is totally right and is often where my mind is, okay, here's the policy environment we have now, what can we change about it? I just add, um, you know, a couple things you can do leaving here today. They are not addressing the core of the problem, but some of them get there. Thank, thank your state legislator here in California if they supported increasing the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. Doing that, yeah, doing that across the state uh, is a huge help. Um, to Doria's point, ask your school board member um, what's it gonna take for there to be gardens and garden education in every school? And maybe it's gardens plus cooking. Maybe it's a whole home ec uh, updated for our current needs. Um, and then, you know, we, we can get into this later. I think there are ways you can support better systems of food assistance, either increasing, well, we can get into the details of that, but they're existing policies well, right now. That was actually going to be where I went next. Ha ha, so let's get <laughs> yeah. into it now. Okay. I'll, I can add to what yeah. Eli said, which is that SNAP, called CalFresh in California, or food stamps historically, is effective. Every economist um, doing rigorous research will tell you that SNAP reduces the depth, breadth, and severity of food insecurity. SNAP is a very controversial issue right now, and there are many people um, in DC who are very dedicated to tearing down SNAP benefits. And we have to realize that for many households, this is one of the only social supports that are left. We let many people with very few uh, other strategies for support go without access to affordable housing without access to, um, to job retraining and educational skills. There are so many things we don't provide anymore. Food is the, is the only support system that many very low-income households get. Uh, if you are interested in reading a fascinating book on this, Catherine Eden's $2 a Day is a great, very recently published book describing what it's like in the United States to live on $2 a day. $2 being that, that amount globally we use to uh, define what it means to be in extreme poverty. Uh, but there are hundreds of thousands of people in the US living on less than $2 a day. Yeah, uh, I think building on Hillary, and back to Doria's point, these, these start could be categorized as creative ways to have better support systems that aren't getting at the core, but are hopefully helping address, at least temporarily, um, hunger and, and health. Um, one, there's efforts to cut SNAP at the federal level, um, which I think is the exact opposite direction than where we should be going. It's a pretty small uh, support and should be increased across the board. How we decide who gets SNAP and federal benefits, we could dive deep into this, but the long and the short of it is there is one rate nationally, which is $24,000 a year for a family of four. If you make more than that, $24,000 for a family of four, if you make more than that, regardless of whether you're in rural Mississippi or in San Francisco, you have to be below that to qualify for food stamps, SNAP, CalFresh, whatever we want to call it. That's crazy. 
That's especially crazy in most urban areas in the country and, and higher cost of living rural areas. So that's one thing we could change. Another, a lot of, you may have seen in California, a program called Market Match. Um, it helps right. uh, increase the amount of money people have for healthy fruits and vegetables. Um, it's an incentive. The, say you buy $7 at the farmer's markets of fruits and vegetables, the farmer's market gives you seven extra dollars. That's a program that could be expanded not just at farmer's markets, but also grocery stores nationally. There are people working here locally and across the country on this, and that would be a creative way to increase purchasing power and also target it specifically to healthy food. Yeah. Those are just a few of the ways we should be putting way more money towards school meals. Right. I mean, that's another one where it right. reaches millions and millions of people. Or doing simple things like in Richmond, one of the things we're trying to do is just get a salad bar in every school <laughs> so that not, not only do kids have the hot lunch, which is, you know, what it is, uh, but they have access to healthy whole foods every day that they're at school. And most kids in Richmond receive two to three of their meals at school every day. And so most of their calories are coming from the federal school uh, food program. So at least have a healthy food option <laughs> there. Um, and hopefully some programming around that. So again, people, you know, are open to the idea of eating what's in the salad bar. Um, I totally agree with the market, market match um, program. That's one of the most powerful programs I think we have in terms of, um, of having a real incentive for people to spend more money on fruits and vegetables. You know, if you get twice your money, if you buy fruits and vegetables, that's a huge you know, like incentive to go ahead and get more food, healthy food for yourself. I think it's brilliant. Um, I, I, uh, uh, yeah, I think I'll just leave it there. <laughs> and I hope at some point Hillary talks a little bit about Eat SF, which is a similar to Market Match and slightly different model. But Let's about. make that some point right now. All right. <laughs> uh, Eat SF is similar to the Market Match program where we um, provide low-income residents of San Francisco living in, um, in the most high-poverty neighborhoods of the city with vouchers that they can redeem for fresh or frozen fruits or vegetables. A similar model to Market Match where we are trying to both support people's uh, um, desire to purchase healthy vegetables and also supporting local food vendors who have challenges because of turnover uh, stocking fruits and vegetables that the neighborhood needs. So that's the EDSF program. Wow, that's fantastic. So we're nearing that part in the program where we are starting to wind down. So I would love to hear closing comments from each of you. And before I do, and closing comments are anything that either wasn't said or that you would like to emphasize. And I'm gonna throw in a couple of questions from the audience, our last couple of questions. Don't feel the need to address these. I just wanted to make sure that they got out there in case you wanted to address them. How do the arts and creative placemaking play a role in changing food behavior relationships? Story, you addressed that a little bit, but we're looking specifically at arts here and how that relates to food insecurity. And then um, a, a, a bit of a controversial question here. How do we build gardens in low-income neighborhoods without increasing property value and displacing the families they are built to serve? So I'll, I'll just toss that in your lap for your closing <laughs> comments there. Um, you don't build gardens in a vacuum. You know, you actually are engaged in the larger, <laughs> your larger political uh, sphere and you realize that your activities do have outcomes uh, such as rising income, you know, uh, property values. Um, so for instance, in Richmond, um, you know, Urban Tilth doesn't just talk about food. We're guilty of talking about, you know, displacement and talking about social justice and economic justice and how all these things are interconnected. And, you know, actually when you teach ecology, you, te you teach kind of a systems approach to life and living and that, you know, no one thing in the system is isolated, but everything actually has an impact on each other. And so, yes, m me creating a beautiful garden in um, a once blighted community will radically change the property values and bring other people and possibly displace other people. So then we need to think about things like rent control. And we need to think about things uh, like, you know, how do we make sure we have incomes for low-income people, a minimum wage, minimum wage enrichment was voted to be raised, um, so that people can afford to stay. How do we make sure we have local hire? 
How do we make sure that when we're doing this work, we're emphasizing hiring and training the people from that community to lead? Um, mm -hmm. It's not, it, it's not a, 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 a guarantee that people won't get pushed out. People are getting pushed out of Richmond now. Um, but it's at least something that you can do so you don't, you're not a complete uh, victim. Can I, I Thank just you. want to follow up on that. Um, and remember that these are your closing comments yeah. as well. Because mm -hmm. um, this comes up in San Francisco all the time where I've done more of the work on urban agriculture. And I think what I would say is exactly what Doria said, gentrification displacement's happening probably regardless of whether that garden gets built or not. There are broader forces at work, economic forces, um, where here especially, uh, you have industries that pay enormous amounts of money for the work people are doing, especially in the tech industry, and that has ripple effects on the cost of housing. And that is not related to whether there are gardens being built in your neighborhood and has a way larger impact. It's not to say you won't see higher property values, but I think it's a small drop in the bucket compared to the bigger things at work. Okay. My biggest point I want to leave you all with is here in the Bay Area and nationally, I think for years we've heard the message that we should vote with our forks. Make good conscious consumer choices, and we've been mm -hmm. talking about choices, and that's so true. Mm -hmm. um, but what we also need to continue doing is voting with our vote. And Hillary made this plug before, and I really hope that all of you ask all your elected officials at every level, local, state, and national, what they're doing to address the issues we talked about. So that could be at the school board level, it could be at the state level when it comes to a minimum wage, it could be at the federal level when we talk about SNAP policy or otherwise. Um, they don't talk about it a lot. Most elected officials are not being asked about this frequently. And we have an election coming up in November and it's a great time to ask, and I encourage everyone to do that. I'm gonna roll back and uh, just close a little bit too and then pass it on to Hillary. And so I, I kind of wanna close with the thought that we haven't really, what, what should we be thinking about as we kind of face the future? Um, and we have, you know, the war on poverty happened. When was that where we had the beginning of the war on poverty? It's been going on for so long and there's very little change. In fact, things are getting worse. I think that we need to have a deeper conversation about what are our priorities as a people, as Americans. Um, you know, is food a right? We actually need to have that question answered. Is food a right? Is housing a right? I just came back from Cuba, and in Cuba, it's a right. It's illegal to be homeless, not because homeless people are illegal, because everybody has a house. And nobody pays rent. Everybody has food. What kind of choices can we make as a people to ensure that everyone, all of our people, have certain rights? And that's kind of radically rethinking how we've kind of approached our culture for, for you know, many, many, many years. <laughs> I don't know what the years are. Um, once we really start with those larger questions, then some of the policies we need will make more sense and be more possible. And I think that in our, in our various communities, we need to be having those conversations. How do we hold land? Should sh some land be communal? You know, be held collectively and managed collectively? You know, I think that um, without really looking at ourselves and saying, what is it that we believe in as Americans, um, we're never gonna solve these problems. So let me close by bringing us back to food insecurity and health. And um, I think it's very clear that food insecurity is tightly related to health. And what we have done by adequately funding our healthcare system or somewhat adequately funded our, funding our healthcare system and not our food system is that we have shifted the burden 
to the healthcare system. The people who develop diet-related chronic disease as a consequence of their food insecurity, we are paying for down the line in obesity and diabetes. That it does not make sense. Prevention is always more cost-effective than treating the complications, and it does not make sense for the families who have to deal with the poor quality of life that goes along with not having had access to healthy food through their entire life. So if we were doing the economically rational thing, if we were doing the cost-efficient thing, we would be investing upstream in prevention, and that means preventing food insecurity and preventing lack of access to affordable food. So I think we've heard tonight many, many different reasons why we should be more proactive about addressing food insecurity, but the fact that we're paying for them on the tail end through our healthcare costs, uh, I think needs to be another one that we seriously look at as a society and decide we'd rather be investing those dollars <coughs> in helping people eat healthy today than waiting till they get diabetes 10 years from now. Thank you all. Thanks to Dr. Hilary Seligman, professor at the University of California, San Francisco Medical School. Thanks to Doria Robinson, executive director of Urban Health. And thanks to Eli Zegas, food and agriculture policy director at SPUR. Please also join me in thanking the California Wellness Foundation for sponsoring this enlightening discussion about food, health, and vulnerable Americans. I'm Nikki Silvestri, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. <laughs>